Please stand. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. He is the light which shines in the darkness. of the grace and peace of Christ be with you all. Let us pray. Shine into our hearts the light of your wisdom, O God, and open our minds to the knowledge of your word, that in all things we may think and act according to your good will and may live continually in the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
reading from Colossians. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the Lord, the word of Christ, dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father before him. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming he that he was with the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. 
His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and favor and in divine and human favor. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We who worship in the Lutheran tradition follow the common lectionary for our Sunday Bible readings. This means the lessons for each Sunday are predetermined. And they come up in a three-year rotation, year A, year B, and year C. We're in year C now, which is great. But what we have in our gospel today is after celebrating the baby born in Bethlehem two days ago, while we still sing Christmas carols, we find the 12 year old Jesus in the temple. Quite a leap in time and context. So, Today, we hop in our Star Wars time transporter and begin with this passage from St. Luke. Now, every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. Yes, Jesus and Mary and Joseph and the other children did this every year. Regular, predictable, like clockwork without fail kind of like you here again today in church on the first Sunday after Christmas the kind of faithfulness you show today is the kind that makes teenagers exclaim what church again we've been there all week but those of us who show up every Sunday especially on this Sunday after Christmas value the habit of worshiping faithfully and regularly. And we know the gifts this discipline affords to us. The Gospel of Luke reveals Mary and Joseph to be rule followers. Once they got past the tumultuous beginnings that they had as a couple, namely the surprise pregnancy, the post-conception marriage, the birth in a stable away from home, after this rocky but still faith-filled beginning, they clearly followed the rules of their faith. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day as it was prescribed. When it came time for Mary to be purified after childbirth, she and Joseph went to the temple again and carried with them the prescribed offering. While there they met the faithful Simeon and Anna and heard these holy elders offer predictions and praise for their baby boy. So, Mary and Joseph making the annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the holy festival of Passover, this should not surprise us. With this trip, they were in many ways clothing themselves with righteousness since following the rules was a critical element of faith in their Jewish world. The trip described today in our gospel was an act of faithfulness in the lives of faithful people, folks whose motto might have been, just keep on keeping on. You know, the wisdom of this statement We know the wisdom of this statement, don't we? If you are a regular worshiper, you probably know the empty, funny feeling, that incomplete feeling that you get when you skip worship, even for one week. It feels like something's missing, not only from the week, but also something inside. It's like something's missing from the soul Though every week may not be a spiritual high for us, each week does add to our bank of memory 
and to our, our bank of experience of worshiping and communing and bonding with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But you know, sometimes, occasionally, something really hits home. And you leave worship a changed person. Your life, your outlook, and your understanding. Your understanding of who and whose you are is renewed and resolved. Perhaps this is what happened to Jesus that Passover when he was 12 years old. Something he heard or experienced in the familiar rituals may have struck him in a new, clear, inspiring way. We can only imagine because the story does not tell us. What we do know is his parents left Jerusalem without him though they thought that he was somewhere in the cloud of relatives and friends who traveled together, it was the next day that they realized Jesus was not alone. Now, I don't know what kind of fears Mary and Joseph had in their hearts. Would they, like us, have worried about child abduction? Did they think Jesus may have run away? What guilt do you suppose overwhelmed them he was, after all, only 12 years old, and he was alone in a big city. Who knows where he was and with whom? Surely these are the thoughts that ran through their minds as parents. Three days they searched. Can you imagine? Perhaps they searched the temple last, <laughs> like I would have done if it had been one of my sons thinking their adolescent son would be anywhere but there. Parents among us understand Mary's burst of impatience when they finally found him. If they had paused for a moment, they might have seen, they might have noticed their curious son sitting at the feet of the teachers. If they had waited, they would have noticed his engagement his curiosity, and the mutual expect already apparent between Jesus and the teachers. But they did not wait, like you and I. From the sound of it, Mary was overwhelmed with emotion, saying to Jesus, Child, why have you treated us this way? Jesus' mother and Jesus' father were focused only on one thing. They could see and feel nothing but their own anxiety. Jesus had broken their rules, and they took it personally. Those of us who are parents would have the same response. Three days of panic would be hard to set aside. Jesus' parents' pilgrimage to Jerusalem just did not go the way they had planned. Don't you take it personally when life does not go the way you had it planned out? Hmm. If the circumstances had been different for them, they would have been proud of him. They would have seen the wonder of their son emerging into manhood. They would have seen a person of faith and yes, they would have been proud, and maybe they were later, once they kind of calmed down. You know, sometimes our insistence on doing things the right way, our own way, gets in our own way. Sometimes being clothed in righteousness is a burden rather than a blessing. Moments of grace are rarely predictable and are often not recognized in the moment in which they occur. Imagine, for example, the utter surprise those people around Jesus on that day when they found him would have, been, would have had if they had realized that this curious, this intelligent 12-year-old boy named Jesus would turn out to be the Messiah the longed-for Prince of Peace. I suspect that there had been pre precocious boys around before, 
but the Messiah? Who would think it? We know the disruption that Jesus will cause in that community and that part of the world in the future. In just 20 short years, these same teachers in the temple will reach the end of their rope with him. Perceived as a threat to their carefully tended truce with the Roman occupiers, they will stand by as he is killed, hoping the disruptions will end and the Roman authorities will just leave them alone. In the end, the teachers in the temple took Jesus' love as a threat and they tried to snuff it out. They chose murder in order to preserve their illusion of always being right. What if God were to act in this same way? What if our disruptions of God's kingdom were taken by God so personally? What if God saw them as personal threat to him? What if they caused him such great anxiety? Of course, we do. We do disrupt God's perfect kingdom quite regularly, do we not? What must God think as he watches us pillage the earth he so carefully fashioned then gave to us as a precious gift? What grief must we cause God when, do, when we do not trust his ability to provide for us or even worse when we do not trust God's steadfast love for us should God be blamed if he were exasperated with our inability to get along with his children whether the children we see across our dinner table or the ones that live all over this earth? It would be reasonable for God, don't you think? It would be reasonable for God to demand to know why we act in such ways? Yes, for you and I, it would be reasonable to ask that question. It would be reasonable to think this way. But thanks be to God, God is God and we are not. Thanks be to God, our ways are not God's ways. God does not demand that we make it up. God does not wish to even the score with us. God does not wish us to grovel in shame. Instead, God chooses to love us first, last, and always. God chooses to bring life into the manger. God chooses to bring a baby to the temple. God brings a curious teenagers to the feet of teachers. God chooses to allow a young man, a just young man, to die on a cross and he restores the dead man to life so you and I can be assured of how much he loves us. God treasures us. God cheers for us. And God causes us to grow. God is patient with us. God brings us grace as a gift and as a promise. Therefore, constantly clothed in God's grace, you and I are free, free to proclaim God's love to a waiting and hungry world. This, my friends, is our call from God. Therefore, I implore you, go. Go into the world and share the good news, the story of Jesus Christ, born in a manger, died on a cross, 
resurrected for all. Amen. Let us pray for evangelists and pastors, for teachers and storytellers, for seminarians and those discerning their call to ministry, and for all who proclaim the gospel in word and deed. Lord, in your mercy. For the earth and all its creatures, for those seeking refuge from damaging storms, for those who work outdoors in weather that is hard to bear, in winter cold or summer heat, and for all whose labor provides us with food, clothing, shelter, and transportation, Lord, in your mercy. For all nations and their leaders, for those who bring harmony within division, for those who challenge injustice and prejudice, and for those who are sent far from home to serve and protect others, Lord, in your mercy. For parents of missing children, for youth who have no safe place to call home, for travelers, for those who are anxious, for all who are homebound, including Helen Bradham Tollison and Bob Adams, 
for those serving in the military, especially Justin Lee Morris and Andrea Kuhlman, for those who grieve and all who are recovering from illness, including Skip Rungi, John Laracy, Robin Collins, and the family of Gertrude Hammett. Lord, in your mercy. For this assembly, for musicians and poets, for elders and youth, for those who ask questions and those who mentor others to deeper faith and compassionate service, Lord, in your mercy. With thanksgiving, we remember all who have died, especially those whose lives have helped us to see your love and compassion, Lord, in your mercy. Pondering the mystery of your love, we offer our praise, our prayers in the name of Christ, the Word made flesh. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share the peace.
Let us pray. God and loving God, we rejoice in the birth of Jesus, who came among the poor to bring the riches of your grace. Bless the gifts we offer this day, and let them be a blessing for others. For with the trees of the field, with all the earth and heaven, we shout for joy at the coming of your Son. Amen. May the good Lord be with you. Lift your hearts to God in praise. flesh great and wondrous mystery now we see with vision fresh God's abundant majesty For with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven above, let us praise his name whose birth brings to us eternal love. Holy One, the beginning and the end, the giver of life. In the, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And he gave thanks and gave it to all of them, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection. We look with hope for his coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us. Bless this meal. May your word take flesh in us. Awaken your people. Fill us with your light. Bring the gift of peace on earth. All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel, Word of God incarnate, power of the Most High, one God, now and forever.
when we eat this bread, we share the body of Christ. When we drink this cup, we share the blood of Christ.
May the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that in this bread and cup of Christ's very life, you give us food for our journey. As you led the Magi by a star, as you brought the Holy Family home again, guide us on the way unfolding before us. Wherever we go, may our lives proclaim good news of great joy in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the word that brought Mary brought to birth carry you into new and abundant life. May the word that Joseph cradled in his arms enfold you with love and strength. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always.
As you move into the week, please remember with prayers and acts of kindness for our homebound Helen Bradham Tollison and Bob Adams, our military Justin Lee Morris and Andrea Kuhlman, for healing Skip Rungi, John Laracy, and Robin Collins. And also we remember today the family of Gertrude Hammett at her death. Please keep her, her family in your prayers. Be aware that you are invited to the fellowship room and welcome center. You go through that door, through the, the room on the other side, and down the hall. Uh, there's food there. Need I say more? <laughs> Christmas refreshments and conversation. That's, that's important too. And coffee. Uh, you may exit through that door. And uh, I'm reading what Bill Trexler wrote. Uh, Okay, so you know how to find that room. If you're a visitor here today, please know that we especially want you to come and join us at that time. Please, please, please. Uh, Daughters of the King will meet on January 10th for the informal social gathering in the auditorium between services. And if you are not finished with your Christmas and worshiping experience today, after you leave the fellowship room, full of Christmas good cheer and cookies. Then you can get in your car and tune it to 94.3 and hear last evening's candlelight service being played as you go home. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be.